Uh, let's get right to it as we dive into our big story, and that is the Big Ten standings right now, the log jam at the top of the league. Illinois remains in first after beating Indiana in Bloomington Saturday. They'll visit Purdue tomorrow. The Boilers top Michigan Saturday. Wisconsin, a narrow win over Penn State. They head to East Lansing tomorrow to take on a Michigan State team that figures to be in a foul mood after getting pounded at Rutgers. Ohio State, the other team in that top five, they got a comfortable home win over Maryland. Let's sort through it. Uh, let's start with Illinois. They're in first place, and they continue to really impress. They were in a dogfight with Indiana, actually down at the half, and then just turned it on in the second half, Trent. Yeah, probably most impressive week for any Big Ten team was Illinois, that big win over Wisconsin, and then what they did in that second half. I, I thought that game had all the makings to go down to the final possession. I mean, Assembly Hall was rocking. Uh, Indiana was playing well, despite Trace Jackson Davis. You expect him, you know, saddled with foul trouble in the first half to come back and have a big impact in the second half. I thought that was going down to the wire. And Illinois, led by Trent Frazier, just busted that game open. So good defensively, like 40 to 21 in the second half, how they outscored the Hoosiers. Really impressive win. Yeah, their defense was exceptional. And that's where it was really interesting to me because I thought Indiana, I mean, they survived the absence of Trace Jackson Davis in that first half. They got two fouls within the first five minutes of the game and, and sat the rest of the way. And yet Indiana goes into the locker room with the advantage. And then TJD comes back in the second half. But man, Illinois really locked them up. And you combine that with what they did against Wisconsin in the previous game. I mean, defensively, they have been phenomenal here, Trent. Illinois is looking scary good right now yeah. with all the weapons they have. But, yeah, the, the toughness uh, on the defensive end. And, you know, Kofi's such a factor in the paint, but I think it starts with Trent Frazier. You know, he goes for 23 points, uh, 14 in the second half, was really good, 8 for 11 from the field. But defensively, I thought the job he did on Xavier Johnson. Xavier Johnson's been playing really well. Yes. I, I'm – I'm bullish on Indiana because of Xavier Johnson's play. He plays with a competitive spirit that, that he brings to the team. But that matchup was really fun to watch. I mean, both those guys, you know, they, they talk some trash. They get into each other. And in the first half, it was somewhat of a, to uh, a toss-up. But that second half, Trent Frazier, you know, I heard Rick Pisa say this. He was saying first team all Big Ten. I, I don't know if Trent Frazier's right there. But I tell you what, he's one of the most undervalued players in the country because he does it on both ends of the court. And when you talk about uh, winning on the road, that comes down to toughness. You know, uh, I think it's Tom Izzo that has a saying, like, good players win games, tough players win championships. Or He's a tough player. Can score the ball, kind of a Nick Van Exel type, I think, offensively, lefty guy. Really kind of herky-jerky, tough to contain. But he brings a toughness and a swagger to that team, which makes him really tough to beat. He has 18 games in his career of 20 or more points. And to your point, 11 of them have been on the road. And Illinois is now 13-3 and three in its last 16 conference road games. I mean, think about that. Think about how hard it is to win on the road in this league. And you know, Brad Underwood was joking afterwards, like, I don't think we you know, won maybe one in our first two years here on the road. And now all of a sudden they, they've turned into this really good road team. And they're just a, a, a fabulous team all around. But, but kind of to your point, defensive end, last two opponents, 6 of 37 from three. I mean, you can win a lot of games if you can shut teams down to, to that degree. Yeah, you know, you, ha you talk about the offensive weapons and Kofi Coburn, obviously, but that's where you can, um, no matter if the shots are falling or not, you're going to be in games. And then if you have guys that can close games, and here's, I, I think the, the thing to watch is look at Andre Corbello. Both these games this week, I thought he looked pretty good in the first half. Maybe missed some shots, but I thought he got in the paint. You know, he kind of showed what he can do. Second half, he barely played because Illinois played so well. And I think what Brad Underwood is doing with him is really good. You don't need him to, you don't need to start him. You don't need him to play major minutes or, or be an impact player every night out. He's going to have some big games. I think he's going to come on strong for them this second half of the season and be a real differ difference maker in games. But you don't need him every night. Give him some time to get back into, into the rhythm of the game, allow his teammates to figure out how to play with him again. So that's just a, it's a scary sight for, Ellen, for opponents when you have a guy like that that hasn't caught his rhythm that I expect to have some big moments this season. Speaking of second halves, Indiana has now been outscored by 55 points in the second half of its Big Ten games. They are a really good defensive team. And I'm curious whether you think, I mean, is it possible they just expend so much energy on the defensive end early that they're kind of wearing themselves down? Is there something else that you would use to, to account for what is a significant disparity? I mean, you want to close well, and Indiana 
as a general rule, has not closed well. I think there's a couple of things. One, you mentioned how much they expend on the defensive end, especially I look at Xavier Johnson. He's picking up full court a lot, and he's playing major minutes. That's difficult to do. And I mentioned he's been playing well, but that's tough to do. Can you have someone else kind of at least pick up the opponent, uh, opposing point guard, make him turn, kind of give that energy on that end because they need Xavier Johnson to make plays on the offensive end. And then I think offensively, and also I would say first, because when they get stops, they're good in transition. They're good when they play with great pace because they can get stagnant offensively. They can just try and kind of force feed Trace Jackson Davis, who I think has kind of become a little bit too one-dimensional. And I want to talk about E.J. Liddell, some other guys, how they get them the ball in different spots with Trace Jackson Davis. It's kind of, it's mostly just post up. I would like to see him maybe facing up. He's so quick. We saw that one possession against Kofi, took him baseline, scored. Uh, he, he's so quick, but he's relying too much on his back to the basket. I'd like to say, see them move him around the court a little bit more. Another guy, Parker Stewart, shooting 45% from three. He's only taking four threes a game. Get him going a little bit more, finding him in some spots because I, I think this team has the potential to get a good seed in the Big Ten in the NCAA tournament and may, and do some damage. But you mentioned second half, you have to you have to be raising your game throughout the game as opposed to kind of falling off in that second half. They've got a big week coming up. They have a game in Northwestern tomorrow, which you can see on the Big Ten Network. I think they really I don't want to say it's a must win, but then you look at the next three games for them after that at Michigan State, Wisconsin at home, at Ohio State. If you don't win in Evanston, all of a sudden that becomes a stretch where, you know, conceivably you could lose four in a row, three of four, don't want to lose the momentum which they had gained here in recent weeks. Let's move on. The most eye-opening result of the weekend to me was Michigan State going to Rutgers and just getting obliterated, Trent. I mean, they lost <laughs> by 21 points. They were completely out tough inside. I mean, it was a mismatch. In the pain. What do you make? I, I do want to talk about Rutgers, and he prays on Rutgers. They're great, particularly at Jersey Mike's Arena. They're, they're fabulous. <laughs> but, man, Michigan State, what do you make of that performance? When you think of Michigan State basketball, you think of rebounding, you think of toughness, you think of how they play in transition. So they get out rebounded by 11. They don't score one fast break point. Zero. 11 to zero That's in incredible. transition. I know. That's hard to believe. Uh, here's another game that was close at half that Rutgers busted open in the second half. So we, 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 you think about 40-minute basketball, you know, and Michigan State's a team that hasn't been consistent game to game. And, at, and on Saturday, they weren't consistent from half to half. you got to put 40 minutes together. This is a team where, you know, Gabe Brown has been struggling. Finally, he plays better on Saturday. You know, he's making shots. He goes for 20 points. But there's others. Max Christie has struggled a little bit in, the, in, the, in recent games, and they just can't seem to get that consistency from player to player. And sometimes when – there's so many guys in that rotation, and the shots aren't consistent night in, night out. That can be more difficult to get that consistency. But I expect this team to respond well. They've done it before after dropping a tough game. We saw them lose to uh, that one to Northwestern at home. They come back and, and really handle uh, Wisconsin on the road very well. So, But this is a team that they're going to be up and down because they don't have that consistency. They don't have that go-to guy to kind of lean on night in, night out. I expect them to finish – in this top five teams of this league, but I'd be surprised if they're winning the league because they're not going to have that consistency night in, night out. Inconsistency at times has been a virtue for them because you don't always know who to key on. And every once in a while, you know, A.J. Hogard has a big game or Malik Hall has a big game. And they have lots of guys who are capable of busting out. But to your point, on Saturday, I mean, only one guy really played well, and, and that was Gabe Brown. Give a lot of credit to Rutgers. I mean, they defended incredibly well and then on the other end amazing I mean shot well over 60 percent in this game they averaged 1.35 points per possession against Michigan State I mean these last three halves of basketball that Rutgers has played the second half against Northwestern they were incredible and then the two halves they put together against Michigan State wow I mean it's really something yeah, and they, they've been inconsistent as well, but, but let's been. talk about yes. how good they were offensively. Defensively, that's where they have to hang their hat, but when they have it going offensively, and you've got to look at Paul Mulcahy. Okay, it was Trey, our guy Trey Dimps, I think. You know, this is a stretch, but he tweeted, you know, Luka Doncic-like against Northwestern that game he had, but then to go for 15-12 and 12 against Michigan State at 6-7 at the point, he's leading the league in assists, five and a half assists a game. He's so good as when he gets in the paint. And I thought earlier in his career, 
he would get he would find himself in that position, but he didn't have the strength or quite the ability to finish plays. Now you see him in the getting in the paint, and you see some of the reads he makes off ball screens, throwing lobs, behind the back passes, his footwork. Uh, to, to find an opening and create space for himself to make shots. He's more of a scoring threat than, he, than he's been in the past. I mean, he's playing at an all-Big Ten level as well. He's a guy that we don't think of in that, in that uh, light, but they're giving him the ball, you know, really before Geo Baker and Ron Harper Jr. He's got the ball in his hands, and he's been making great decisions. He punishes smaller guards in the paint. He can get to his spots and then make plays from there. He's been really impressive. That was the thing that really stood out to me. I did that game at Evanston, and when they made that run in the second half, he clearly was the best player on the court, right? 31 points, 7 rebounds, 7 assists. But he also was the emotional leader. And they're in huddles, and he's yelling and screaming and getting in everyone's face. And you think about they have two stars on their team, right? I mean, Geo Baker and Ron Harper Jr. are stars, and you thought of them as the alphas coming into this year. But I think Paul Mulcahy has become their alpha as well, which again speaks to all those other intangibles, the other things he does so well. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, the team that Michigan State now is going to host on Tuesday. I had that game on Great Saturday. first half, right? It was really good. Yeah, 18 to 13. What did Penn State have? Five points with five minutes left or so in the first half? Penn State had one field goal in the first 12 minutes, wow. I believe. Yeah, they had, they had three The second points. half was much better. The but. second half was great. It was actually a really yeah, compelling was. game. And, and give them both credit. They both elevated their game. But this is the second, really the third straight game, if you go back, that Wisconsin hasn't played well offensively. Now, they've won two of them which I think speaks to all these other things that Wisconsin does really well. But how concerned are you? How concerned should Badgers be, Badger fans be, about the fact that, you know, Johnny Davis has been somewhat pedestrian here. Brad Davison hits big shots when they need him, but he was shut out for the bulk of, of that game on Saturday. How big a deal is that? Yeah, it's one thing to win good close games. I want to get into that, too. But uh, we talked about this in the pregame that Wisconsin's last in the league in field goal percentage, 42%. And field goal percentage defense, by yeah, the way. Which is hard to believe. Yeah. They're last in assists per game, 11 assists per game. And what that tells me is they're relying a lot on one-on-one play. Okay, they have some guys, especially Johnny Davis, Tyler Wall, that can create one-on-one. But they're just having to manufacture tough shots and make tough shots. It's difficult to shoot at a high percentage. It's, it's difficult to be very efficient when that's the case. And I think they need to get much better, quicker, more ball movement uh, to get better quality looks. It's too much to kind of iso ball. And, and it's, you know, now, especially as you get more into the season, these teams, you know, in the Big Ten, nobody scouts like these coaches. Yeah. And every, there's a game plan for, to stop Johnny Davis. And they know what they need to do. They're throwing multiple guys at him. They're making him take tough, contested two, long twos or threes off the bounce. He's not that good of a shooter to shoot at a high clip when those are his, the shots that he's taken. So I think they got to move the ball quicker, let that ball see multiple sides of the floor. Then you can attack those one-on-one matchups when you have an advantage. Stephen Crawl probably won them the game, frankly. Some big uh, threes. Three threes. There was one where they kind of used Davis as a decoy coming out of a timeout, and Dave, uh, Crawl hit one from the top of the key at five assists. I mean, for a seven-footer who played, I think, 38 minutes all of last year, it's pretty remarkable to see what he has done and, and how his game has grown. And Greg Gard was telling me, we absolutely saw this coming. He said he was tearing up the scout team last year, but they just had veteran big men and there just wasn't a place for him. But he, he's really good. Wisconsin seems to develop players as well as anybody. Yeah. And when you have a five man that can pick and pop, that can step out, now all of a sudden your bigs got to leave that paint. It opens up the paint. So if he's doing that, that's really going to be effective. You know, the, you mentioned the assist as well. That's really... That's a great advantage when your big man can do that. I do want to give credit to Penn State. This was a crazy story. And if, if you didn't watch the game or didn't follow it this weekend, so they had you know, they used a charter company, which a lot of these schools do. There was an aircraft that was supposed to come out of College Station, Texas, go to Lincoln, Nebraska, and pick up their women's team, and then head to State College and bring the men's team to Madison. Well, they had that huge ice storm in Texas and the College Station Airport had no de-icing equipment. And so the plane was just stuck there. The women's team was stuck in Lincoln. They didn't leave State College until after noon on the day of the game. They landed two and a half hours before the game. They went to the hotel. They got a quick bite. They got to the arena an hour before and obviously did not start well, as we talked about. But, man, the resilience to play as tough as they did, Trent, it, it was pretty impressive. 
Well, it speaks to Micah Shrewsbury and I think the culture that he's building because I, I thought maybe they'll come out and they'll play free. Maybe it's, it's, it's you're not thinking too much. You just get out there and hoop. That wasn't the case. No, they played and, like garbage. And, yes. <laughs> they did. <laughs> and you could have easily felt sorry for yourself, yeah. made excuses, and, and just kind of mailed it in at, at halftime. Hey, we're on the road. We're against Wisconsin. We're not going to win this game. But they stuck together. They had a chance. They had a shot to win it yes. at the game. Miles yes. Dredd, a decent look for three that would have won the game at the buzzer. So that speaks to, I think, what Michael Shrewsbury is building because he doesn't quite have the talent, but they're competitive. They're grinding out games. They defend. They play hard. They shot like 31% from the field and had a chance to win against a Wisconsin team that's, you know, at the top of the league is, is really impressive. I did think late game situation, though, they found a way to tie it. And I thought Wisconsin just handled that end of game much better. Yeah. Great play to get Tyler Wall the ball on a closeout, attacking it for a bucket. Wisconsin used their fouls. Sam Sessoms wasn't in the game. He's the only player in double figures. He wasn't in the game, the final possession. So I didn't quite get that. But Penn State, they're a tough team. They're going to cause some problems for whoever they play this year. And I think the future is very bright for them. Wisconsin 11 and 1 now in games decided by six Incredible. points or fewer. It, it is really remarkable. And, and you were talking about they didn't make any excuses. Penn State, uh, Michael Shrewsbury said to me before the game, he told his team, excuses are for losers. And, and you could see that mentality, right, uh, at, at a place where they have not won in Madison since 1995. They've never wow. won at the Kohl Center, wow. ever. 0-18 oh, now, all time. And as you said, they were right there at the end. Well, we're going to turn our attention briefly to football, Max. Plenty more from Trent coming up. But there's ongoing drama in Ann Arbor. Michigan now in the market for two coordinators. Josh Gaddis's departure, a bit acrimonious on his end. We'll sort it out next. To football, where Big Ten champ Michigan is now in the market for coordinators on both sides of the ball. Josh Gaddis, who won the Broyles Award as the nation's top assistant coach this offseason, is leaving to take the offensive coordinator spot on Mario Cristobal's new staff at Miami. The 38-year-old Gaddis had a solid but unspectacular offense his first two years in Ann Arbor. They busted out, though, this year, finishing second in the Big Ten in scoring. Now, here's where it gets interesting is that there seems to be some acrimony here, at least judging by this. ESPN's Tom Van Haren reporting Gaddis texted some players saying, quote, unfortunately, the past few weeks has told a different story to me about the very little appreciation I have here from the administration. In life, I would never advise anyone to be where they are not wanted. There you have it. Here to sort it all out, Nick Baumgartner, who covers Michigan for The Athletic. Uh, Nick, that does not feel great, frankly. Any sense of the context here and what Josh Gaddis was talking about. Well, I, I, you know, I haven't talked to Josh, so I don't want to put words in his mouth specifically there, but I think that, you know, I think you could look at the situation that Michigan just went through with Jim Harbaugh's will he or won't he and everything else in between and the lack of communication that went on between he and his superiors, which included he and his staff. Uh, you know, I mean, I think you could pick a number of different reasons. You know, I don't know which, which it would be, but it hasn't exactly been you know, a month of let's let's get all, you know, momentum, you know, in a bottle and push it forward at Michigan. It's been quite the opposite. And as everyone's waited for Jim Harbaugh to figure out what he wanted to do and all this. And so, you know, I'm not sure what exactly, Josh, you know, what, you know, spurred that on or whatever, that, that, that that's how he feels. But that certainly seems like that's how he feels. If that's what he's telling the players as he leaves. I know he's also, you know, going to get a good chunk of change here uh, from Miami to be their other offensive coordinator. Not sure if he, you know, countered to Michigan and they didn't, uh, didn't re up it, but um, I'm not sure what the, what the exact reason is uh, for his, you know, what have you on the way out. I guess that'll be for him to address. But um, you know, I think that right now it's been a rocky couple of weeks here. So I think that you could consider there's probably a few things maybe. It's certainly a sharp contrast to what he said when he won the Broyles Award and yeah. was incredibly emotional and profusely thanking. Jim Harbaugh for sticking with him. So perhaps it was more about others than it was about Harbaugh. But it has been a weird month, to, to say the yeah. least. We spent a lot of time in the last week talking about it. And that's simply because there is a, a ton to talk about here. And as I mentioned mm -hmm. off the top, we're not just talking about losing the offensive coordinator, but loss of defensive coordinator Mike McDonald going back to the Ravens. And maybe that one a little yeah. less surprising, just given that uh, he had come from the NFL, and, and when that position came open, it would make sense to, to go back there. But any sense of how either of these openings will be filled? Jim Harbaugh, quite uh, famously, I guess, really 
redid his staff in the offseason. Mm -hmm. He got a lot younger. There was a lot of praise heaped on the assistants and position coaches on both sides of the ball. Is it your sense he stays internal with these hires, or where do you go? Yeah, offensively, I would look for a combination, possibly. Matt Weiss, uh, the quarterback's coach who they hired for Baltimore, who's also worked with John Harbaugh, you know, big into analytics, um, did a lot with Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy, of course, last year, and Jim Harbaugh. Matter of fact, Dave, I think if Jim Harbaugh had gotten the Minnesota Vikings job offer, whatever you want to call it there, uh, I would have bet on Matt Weiss being the guy that left with Jim Harbaugh, not anyone else, uh, frankly. So I think Matt Weiss will be in a situation there where, you know, he'll have an added role. Maybe he's a play caller. Maybe he's an offensive coordinator. Maybe it's a co-offensive coordinator situation with him and uh, Sharon Moore. And I think Sharon Moore, who was Josh Gaddis's, you know, sort of right-hand man, and he was the co-OC last year and their offensive line coach. I would argue right now, Dave, I think Sharon Moore is their most important assistant. I think he's their best recruiter. Uh, I think he's their best and most valuable position coach. And if it were me, I would lean on him maybe to, you know, help scheme the offense as you go forward with maybe a Matt Weiss. I could definitely see a combination of those two working with Jim Harbaugh as they go forward, which would bring a question about someone like Mike Hart. You know, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if Mike Hart's in the conversation for that job or not. And if he's not, you know, is that something where he's going to continue to grow as a coach uh, here, not being a coordinator. So Michigan's got a lot of talented coaches here. And, you know, I think that that's part of what's going on as well, but also like, you know, this is all stuff that could have been hashed out in January, could have been hashed out in December, um, frankly. And uh, now it's here in February and they're still doing it. On the defensive side, do you think that's an external hire? It could be. You know, I think that would be the one where I would be more uh, in, in inclined to believe that could be the similar situation to what he just did, right? He went to the NFL, uh, pulled his brother and Bill Belichick and a couple other people and said, you know, who's a young guy that is creative that I could get behind? I could absolutely see him doing something like that. Get somebody, give me somebody no one's ever heard of, right? And and do something similar. I could see him doing something along those lines. But I could also see him taking someone like Steve Plinkscale, uh, who's here, uh, and elevating him to a co-position. And either way, it's going to be someone who's familiar with odd fronts, familiar with the base of what they put in last year. Um, I don't think it'll be tough for them to re, you know, sort of reverse engineer what Mike McDonald did from a scheme standpoint. But you know, the calls in the moment and everything are going to have to be uh, taken by somebody else. So that'll be different. Nick, just more broadly here, I mean, this was such a great story this year. It was such mm -hmm. a sense of palpable relief and joy from Michigan fans. This is the program that's won the most Big Ten championships. They were in their longest drought. They had their longest losing streak against Ohio yeah. State. I mean, all of these things where they kind of question their place in the college football pecking order, all of that got erased. And then went to the playoff and, and look, did not perform well, but many teams would not have performed well against that Georgia team. It, it still felt like there was such a great vibe around the Michigan program. Can it be recaptured? I mean, I'm, I, I said this last week and I'm going to just kind of reiterate the question. Are we just being prisoners of the moment here? And are we going to get through this and just say, man, look at all the positive things that they did. And they still have Jim Harbaugh, who, aside from the one year last year that I think a lot of us feel like maybe was a blip with the, the COVID season has really mm -hmm. done a nice job of, of getting them back to being competitive on a year in and year out basis and, and now being on equal footing at least one year with Ohio State. You wrote last week about some lack of communication within the Michigan program. Like kind of where is this thing right now? Yeah, I think all the things can happen. All things that they want here can happen with Jim Harbaugh. I think they can move forward productively and he can be all the things that he says and claims that he wants to be like, I want to be here for the long haul. I want to do all this. I want to do all that. All that can happen. And I think they all can work together, but will is a different situation. Will and can are two different words. And I, you know, I just do not know if I buy it when I hear from him that he says, I'm never going to do this again. I don't, I don't buy that. I mean, I'm going to have to believe it to see it or see it to believe it, I should say. Right. So I think that's sort of the situation here. Um, you know, everyone is allowed to explore, you know, different career avenues and choices and all this. But I mean, like to do it and act like no one else was impacted by it for that long, like and, and to in a way that Michigan looked like it was your safety pick. You know, people saw that. And so it will be, you know, incumbent upon Jim Harbaugh to do what he always does, I guess, is to go out and prove everyone <laughs> wrong. Because I think <laughs> we were probably sitting here a year ago at this time being like, is he ever going to do anything? Is he ever going to win anything? And then yeah. he did. So, I mean, I don't know, Dave. It's, it's a rocky road with Harbaugh. 
Um, nothing surprises me. That didn't surprise me, him coming back, of course. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. We'll see where it all goes. If we'll anybody see. can figure it out, I suppose it's him. I'm going to be fascinated to see if, if and when he does say something publicly. I mean, is there just going to be kind of some routine press conference where, you know, oh, by the way, Jim, things were hanging in limbo for a month. Can we, can we talk about that? I, I don't know. He's He yeah. is an endlessly fascinating guy. We have spent a lot of time talking about him here in the last week. You've shed a lot of light on the situation and, and really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Nick. Absolutely, Dave. Thank you. If you missed our women's hoops game last night on the Big Ten Network, you missed a show. Iowa's Caitlin Clark had 46 points, 25 in the fourth quarter alone. That's a 100-point-per-game pace if you're keeping track. She hit three-pointers from distances that conjured up images of Steph Curry. I mean, we are talking just a few steps inside half court. She's hitting him in between multiple defenders, also a 10 assists. But it was sixth ranked Michigan that came away with the win. They led by as many as 25. Nas Hillman, 26 and 10. Michigan's won eight in a row. Megan McEwen is joining us. Megan, I hate to lead with the team that lost because Michigan was incredible. And, and we'll get to Michigan because they deserve every ounce of our praise. But I said when you were here in the studio last week that I did not have a vocabulary suitable to describe Caitlin Clark. And I'm even more at a loss now than I was a few days ago. She was simply unbelievable. How do you describe what we saw from her last night? Dave, I might have a dictionary back here somewhere, a thesaurus that maybe <laughs> might be able to help us describe what Caitlin Clark has been able to do this season. It's truly remarkable what she's been able to accomplish. Five triple doubles so far this year that leads the nation. She leads the country not only in points per game, but also in assists per game. The only other player to ever do that in college basketball, men's or women's, is Trey Young. And he's had a pretty good NBA career. But what Caitlin Clark is doing right now, it's so good for women's basketball. It goes beyond the stat line because right now her types of performances are so exciting. She's unique from the standpoint that she plays with a ton of passion and swagger, but ultimately she's bringing eyes to women's basketball games. You have NBA players like Kevin Durant tweeting about her, putting her on their Instagram stories. You have men's basketball analysts like Rafael Davis tweeting about her and talking about her during games. You have women's basketball analysts talking about her. As a result, so many eyes are on the women's game right now, and that's only going to grow our game, which is what everybody wants to do. But make no mistake, what Caitlin Clark is doing right now is incredible. I'm most impressed with her facilitating standpoint because when you have 10 assists and you're also scoring 46 points, it goes to show you that unselfish piece that makes Iowa really good. I think what's so remarkable to me about it is, I mean, the outside shooting is crazy. And again, when you talk about kind of growing the women's game, I mean, she is shooting from places that really nobody outside of Steph Curry would think about shooting from. I mean, these are not just three-pointers, not just deep three-pointers, but these are several feet onto the logo deep. Where as soon as she is inside half court, she's in range. I mean, again, like, what, look at that one. That's crazy. That is a 35-footer in rhythm. There is no, no one's doing that. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. Like, I, again, like that to me is what is, is so transcendent about her. She is playing a game that no one else is playing, Megan. And I hate to say this, right, because we, we live in this world in a lot of ways. I, I hate what it's become. But, like, she was trending on Twitter last night, okay? And, and on one hand, it's like, who cares, right? Like, it's this artificial <laughs> world that we've created for ourselves where all of a sudden, like, it becomes news. But it also mm -hmm. speaks to what people are talking about. And it is so awesome for the women's game it's awesome for the Big Ten, frankly. It's great for her to have people talking about her and to understand that she is doing things and to putting eyeballs on the fact that, again, it's not just she's a great woman's player. She's a great player, period. 35-footers. No one does that. No, it's like watching the Harlem Globetrotters or watching some basketball yeah. trick shots almost. Yeah. And the only player you can compare her to when watching her shoot those shots is Steph Curry. 
because it's that logo shot, it's that exciting, quick trigger, quick release. I think what's so cool about Caitlin Clark is we see a lot of players in our game who are big time names. I think of like a Diana Taurasi or a Paige Beckers, and those are all UConn players or Tennessee or SEC players. But this is a player in the Big Ten at the University of Iowa, nonetheless, who's had great teams. Lisa Bluter is one of the best coaches in women's college basketball. But to have this caliber of player in the Big Ten, I think speaks volumes of how talented this league is and why it's one of the best in the country. And the best team in this league appears to be Michigan. They are really, really good. And to beat Indiana in the way that they did last week and then to beat Iowa. So they win a game in the 60s where they grind it out defensively. Their opponent was in the 50s. And then to go and play a game in the 90s against Iowa. What does it say to you about Michigan and and how good this team is? The way you just set up that question tells me everything I need to know about Michigan. And it's that this team has the ability to get to a final four. When you get to the NCAA tournament, all bets are off. You play against so many different styles of teams. Michigan is playing against a team like Indiana, who's one of the most disciplined squads, not only in the Big Ten, but in the country. They slow it down. Michigan was able to change their style of play in order to win that game. Then you play a team like Iowa, who plays at such a fast pace. I mean, you better get your, like, Apple watch on. You're going to win that step challenge when you're playing (laughs) against a team like Iowa. But they're able to compete at that level. Michigan put up 98 points last night. So they can score in multiple ways and win, and they can also slow down the pace of play and win. And the ability to get victories in a variety of ways is what makes them so dangerous. And to me, that's why they're going to make a deep run in the NCAA tournament. Sweet 16 team a year ago, which is the furthest they had ever gone. And I think we'd all be shocked if they don't go further this year. Uh, Looking forward here, we're into the, the final month of conference play i I would say i'm looking forward to the game at the end of the season in iowa city between michigan and iowa someone in rosemont knew what they were doing that's the the last regular season game so that should be incredible what else should we be looking forward to as we head down the stretch here in february I think the point that you bring, I want to point out that Iowa was without starters McKenna Warnock and Gabby Marshall last night. So that's going to be key moving forward into the second matchup. But take a look right now at the current standings in the Big Ten. At the moment, a lot of people have only six teams projected to get into the NCAA tournament. Depending on how this month shakes out, I could see potentially eight teams getting in. Nebraska, Michigan State, and Northwestern being those last three to potentially make the cut. Get ready to see a lot of shakeups happening, though, because the top teams the top eight still have to play a lot of different teams that are also in the top eight not to mention so many games are being rescheduled right now due to covid pauses or travel issues because as you know most of these teams are in the midwest and the weather has not exactly (laughs) been traveler friendly as of late so i'm interested to see how these games kind of shake up down the stretch because a lot of games that weren't necessarily supposed to be there in the beginning are going to pop up and teams are simply going to have to adjust. And we are in the dog days right now, Dave, January into early February. Everyone's tired. Everyone's hurting. But this is the time of year when the best teams need to start peaking. And those that do it now are the teams that make deep runs in March. Uh, it should be really fun. Looking forward to talking about it with you as we continue here down the stretch. Megan, thanks for giving us a few minutes of your time this morning. Thanks, guys. Always good to see you, Dave. 